So I am super excited to introduce Alex Pinto to you because do you remember when we first met Alex Pinto? Oh, I certainly do. It, it feels like yesterday. It does actually. feel like just <laughs> yesterday. We go way back. It was amazing. I'm so excited to have you, Alex. Thank you. I, I don't remember a time when we met that it wasn't amazing. Yeah, it wasn't incredible. me neither. Yeah. So this is Alex Pinto, who is amazing, Chief Data Scientist at MLSEC Project in San Francisco. I don't know if any of you guys have noticed, but of all the speakers here, I think we have a total of two who are local, and everybody else has really gone the distance to fly in here to be with us today. I think we should just actually give a round of applause to all the people who have come here today from far away. Yeah, to be fair, the plane did all the work. So I just <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. So I'm really excited to hear this presentation because he's going to debunk this whole because math stuff for us and do a deep dive on machine learning based monitoring. I'm very excited. I'm going to learn a lot. We're all going to learn a lot. So thank you and take it away, Alex. All right. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. It's, it is really exciting to be here. And not only it, uh, everyone I've met here, I mean, this is an amazing group of people. The food, as Lisa has repeatedly said, is also amazing and very, I mean, a lot of food. So it's, it's been uh, wonderful so far. So um, before we get started, I just want to point out uh, if any of you guys are from the internet and you like doing your Twitters, right? We do have a hashtag for this talk, right? I usually ask people to tag the talk because then later, I can uh, look, at, look the hashtag up and see about, oh, look at this stupid thing this guy said, right? He should shut up. Yeah, so I can, I can laugh along with all the terrible things that you guys are, are talking about me, pretty much. I, I, there, was, there was actually, I tried following Twitter during the talk. That didn't work too well, right? So it's usually, I mean, as a, just as a, as a general uh, public speaking tip, don't do it during the talk. So anyway, uh, let's get started. And I'll start by introducing myself. Right, and uh, so just so you guys can get a feel, and uh, I don't know a lot of you, so I, I need to give, get some, some context as well, right? So my name is Alex Pinto, and I'm the Chief, Chief Data Scientist of MLSEC Project, which has been a wibbly-wobbly way for me to explain that I was trying to do some research in order to put together a stealth startup in this area, right? It's very... I, I personally didn't feel uh, comfortable to set tape, tell people that I was actually doing something until I knew that I had something that could be done, right? And this is a presentation uh, a lot about all the th ways that you can do machine learning for security wrong. And uh, it's pretty much uh, a lot of what we're seeing out there. A lot of people, I'm not sure if they're aware that they're, that they're doing stuff wrong, or at least that the path that they're going through is probably flawed. But uh, I don't know, maybe I can help them out, or maybe they can disagree with me and prove me that I, I am wrong, which would be even awesomer, to be honest, right? And uh, I've been doing this machine learning and training thing for like maybe two years, and before that I was, I don't know, just doing the security stuff and uh, being pretty much scared for life by managing SIM implementations and running SOCs and all those things. And most of what I've done, most of what I've built, was really trying to find a way to work around the, the conundrum that we face, right? We are getting more data, we're getting more things to monitor and, and lots of in different inputs. And can we do this effectively without a bunch of people and without a bunch of different technologies? And, and that's a lot of where this is coming from. So if I sound a lot negative during this presentation as where things don't seem to work, it's because, I mean, I've really tried to love them, but they, they don't seem to be treating me as I am trying to treat them. Uh, also, uh, I just want to point out that given the recent trend on the security industry to, uh, to name threat actors by animals, right, if you need to refer to myself, to attribute something to myself, I am caffeinated capybara. That's my hacker spirit animal. So capybara is the animal for the south, southern part of Brazil, right? If you're from the northern part, it's toucan. So I mean, there's a whole taxonomy. You guys are probably familiar with it. But <laughs> let's get going, right? Let's get going, I guess. I just want to talk really about this machine learning thing. I want to talk about this math thing and how the math thing has really revolutionized security and we have reached the security singularity and we're all out of a job or something right now. And um, 
But I want to take you guys through a journey about uh, what does, where does this trend come from, right? And where, uh, in a way, what's the history between the research in machine learning analytics and anomaly detection for, for security? Maybe those things aren't as new as we would first <laughs> believe that they were, right? And then I really want to try to, uh, to parse a little bit of the marketing speak. So when vendor X is telling you that it's doing Y, what does that probably look like as far as the math is concerned? And what are the potential pitfalls on applying these techniques to the kind of data that we have in security, right? And this is another point that I'll touch on further. Uh, doing this kind of work for security has a lot of unexpected uh, characteristics that people who are usually used to do data analysis and machine learning in other fields, they are not aware. And they, it's usually a shock when they get there, specifically the part of well, where's all the data? <laughs> so where's all the ground truth, right? Well, like, is there anything dependable that I can use so that I can make a decision? And uh, it, it really becomes very challenging. And I hope by the end of this presentation, I can give you guys a little bit of a guideline uh, in the sense that if you are approached by a vendor and the vendor wants to uh, sell you something of machine learning, what are the questions that you, you should ask them? What are the things that you should be concerned about to see if they really understand what they're doing, right? And also if they would be able to really improve some, some uh, process or the other using machine learning. So anyway, I just want to thank all you guys for being here because you're, you're ob obviously all on vacation, on, on, on paid leave because the security problem has been solved, right? I, 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 the, the, the vendor that actually has this tagline, this network security solved, you may see them in airports everywhere. They actually don't do anything on machine learning. I'm really picking on them because I just thought that this tagline was, was amazing, right? But uh, the sense that we get, I mean, the more, it seems that the more deep in this rabbit hole that we are, in the sense that we are, we, uh, we who are, we are in the trenches, right, trying to make this thing work, the more that we realize, okay, this is getting hopeless, uh, because there's so much pressure against us. The vendors, they come with even bolder claims in the sense that now everything is going to be solved. Yeah, forget the other 20 times I told you it was going to be solved. Now it's going to be solved. And the feeling that I get is that, and I get a bunch of questions, right? People ask me about this thing. So when people tell about these machine learning algorithms, is this the same thing, right? Is be, what's the difference between behavioral baselining and anomaly detection, right? Hint, it's all market speak. And uh, what big data security analytics, right? What's the difference between those things? What's the similarity of those things? And I, the point that I want to make is that these questions, they uh, was uh, actual questions that I received from people who are very knowledgeable in this industry. Some of these are from analysts whose job is to try to understand what's going on in information security, right? And it, it, the, the, the level of confusion has got to a state where nobody can, no one can understand what's going on, right? And I think that's very bad. I mean, and I, I'll, I'll tell you specifically because, uh, about that. But before I do, I just want to point out that there's this amazing Tumblr called Big Data Picks. Right? If you ever need like uh, zooming uh, uh, big data like wave or something to put in your presentation, it has the best pictures. You should all go to big data pics and select the picture that you're going to use in your next presentation. It's, like, it's just like, it's just amazing. So what bothers me is really the, the inability to differentiate what's going on. I mean, really hyperdimensional security analytics? I mean, okay, it's got more than three, right? That's what you mean, right? Third generation artificial intelligence. It's just like, it, did you guys see Matrix? It's like when the guy, it, when he goes to the architect and, it, oh, this is like the fifth time the Matrix has come. Is it like the third time the Matrix has happened? That's the third generation AI. And the one that really, I think, sums it up for me is the secure because math, which is the one that I chose for uh, the title of the presentation. And uh, sadly, the company who coined that does not use it anymore. I, 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 I assure you that I had nothing to do with that, right? I think they had dropped it before, but I, I, I mean, the internet never forgets, you know how it goes. And um, I think it really sums up because, oh, you don't need to worry about all this fancy math here. You know, I got a bunch, a, a few PhDs here, they'll do all the math for you, and now you're secure, everything is gonna be, is gonna be fine. The great problem is, I think, it's the differentiation, right? You don't really know what you're getting, right? I mean, I think we've had enough 
of black box-like approaches to security, right? At least if someone is telling you that they're automating something, they should try to be at least a little bit straightforward to, to letting you know what kind of work that they're trying to do, right? Which brings me to, to the follow-up question. Are we even funding the right things, right? Are we, are we, I mean, it's like a dime a dozen now. Uh, the companies who will, I will secure your network using magical machine learning. So anyway, it's not hard. I think it might be a communication issue. Right, and this is something that was pointed out to me. No, you don't get it. It's because when the engineer is explaining to the marketing person what they're doing, the marketing person will just try to write something like, "Oh, it's magical. It's the unicorns," and uh, and uh, you know <laughs> that that's exactly what they'll get. But if you look closely, right? So let's look at the pitches of three different companies, right? And uh, they're not from the same year, right? And these are three. I mean, uh, which one of these three, in your opinion, is from this year? I mean, vote, anyone voting for one, just raise your hand. Two, maybe? What about three? So, okay, a few of them are, there's actually one from this year. You thought I was like, I was like, Taking, I was like taking you. I have to, I have to take a look here because I, I forgot. <laughs> so yeah, it's that hard. So the middle one is from this year, right? The top one is from ten years ago. It's from the. I'm not to tell you the one who is from this year, but the one that's ten years ago was the Proventia. Guys, remember ISS, the Proventia anomaly detection system, right? And I used to tell the anecdote that uh, I, I, I was a principal consultant in one of the, one of the biggest, it's, I think it still is, uh, security consultancies in, in Brazil, in South America. And uh, we were the biggest ISS uh, reseller and, and professional services shop there. And we had thousands, okay, hundreds of, uh, you, see the, you see, you start talking about consultancy, it, it already kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> so we had maybe hundreds of good implementations of the IPSs and all those things. We could never get one of those things to work. Maybe it was just us, I don't know, right? But, and then the, the, the bottom one is one that I, I think it's, it's interesting. It's actually from 20 years ago. It's from uh, something called NIDES, which was actually a research project from SRI. And I want to talk about Dorothy Denning. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. But she, in 86, did the first research that led to what we now understand as an IDS, right? And uh, the cool thing, he called it, she called it the IDES, right? And uh, the cool thing about it is because this original paper already had there, clear as day, you need two different engines. You need a rule or signature-based engine that's going to match the stuff that we know about, and you're going to have an anomaly-based detection engine, right, that's going to do some statistical magic. And she, she got into some detail, which I think is fair, by, by the, the amount of information that was available around networks at that time uh, of how it should be done, right? So it, it's almost 30 years ago, people were already talking about this. And uh, so anyway, this research progressed. Her colleagues, I bet all male, stole her research and launched the next generation a couple of years later. So you know, you guys think you're cool with your next generation firewalls? And uh, people have been doing next generation for 20 so years, right? And uh, everything really changed because of a three-letter acronym, not the NSA. It changed because of the KDD, right? What actually happened is that after the release of, the, of Bro and Snort, which at the time uh, the, the government, the DARPA looked at and said, okay, we're probably good with the signature-based stuff. And boy, were they right. This is exactly what we use to this day. Uh, maybe we should uh, spend some time uh, researching anomaly detection, right? See, if we can uh, actually apply anomaly detection to network data to see if we can do some good work there. And then there was two data sets that DARPA released, which were, I don't know, it was, I, th I think, TCP dump and uh, some Solaris audit logs. God, who remembers that? And uh, which they summarized, right, and then released as DAPA data sets. And then the KDD99 data set, the KDD comes from knowledge discovery something. I think Jay can 
can tell me, I, I completely forgot what the, the other D uh, is about, uh, which was kind of a distilled version of the DARPA data sets so that people could use. And it was amazing because there was a great response. It's pretty much like, like we get the, some of the DARPA challenges that they will uh, incentivize people to do research on something. So we have like, I don't know, maybe six, six, um, 6,500 papers published uh, around the KDD 99, right? Everybody really applied to, to, to it and, and tried to use it. What bothers me is that this year there are still 500. So if you go to Google Scholar and you try to figure out for this year how many people are still using a data set that's almost 30 years old, no, 20 years old. Yeah, 20 years old, sorry. Basic math is, it's lack of coffee, I think. And there's still a lot of people who are using this data set to try to create anomaly detection algorithms. And they are publishing their results. I am very effective in anomaly detection because I can make it work with a tenth of a percentage point better than the paper from last year from other guy, right? And I don't know what you guys think, right? And it's, it's, I know that there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk. That, I mean, there's a, there is a necessity when, you're, when you are providing this sort of research that the data is made public, that it is a public data set. And so that because, and so the, the, the research can be uh, reproducible, right? I mean, not that many people care, do actually do that, care to go through all the hoops, but people, I don't think people are focusing enough about uh, actually trying to create new data sets to try to do some more advanced research. I mean, I, I guess an, uh, it's an analogy would be you're trying to be a, 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 you're going through med school, right? You're learning to be a doctor and all that you have to go on on your anomaly class is this painting from Rembrandt, right? <laughs> so yeah, granted, I don't think the human body changed that much from the anomaly security, from, from, from network security, but then again, yeah, but but, but professor, well, can't we just like cut a new one open? No, 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 that wouldn't go well with the IRS. So I don't think it's a good idea. So it's, it's a problem of using the data. It's a problem of, uh, of uh, do we have the right data to do the research, right? <coughs> and it's not like people are bothered by this now. This is a paper from 2000, right? When this professor from Carnegie Mellon, he was a right, okay, this is actually pointless because it's been two years since we released this. There seems to be significant flaws in this specific data set. And, uh, and uh, it, it has become a game of, I can do 1% uh, better than you, and it's, everyone's ridiculously overfitting the data, and we're not really getting anywhere. We should be trying to fund and trying to get uh, different data sets and, and, and things to go forward with this. And I don't know, uh, given that this is public, Right, and given the prevalence of the, the amount of data that we have, uh, um, the amount of research that we have on the KDD 99, maybe it's a prank, right? Maybe if you get into you know, network security school or something, you're doing research on that, you're required to do a paper on KDD 99, right? Because that's like a rite of passage or something. So anyway, I'm not really, to, really here to bash academia. That's not my point, right? Uh, it's just that, uh, and especially that's not my point because these guys can be very, very scary. You don't want to mess with them. <laughs> but uh, I think the problem is if we, if we realize that most of our research is coming from people who are not using uh, accurate data sets or data sets that at least a little bit better than that, you know, we might get to something like this, right? And that's, this is where I start to tell the story about the, the actual uh, the actual marketing speak and what we're going to do. So I, I borrowed this from, from Gartner, right? And uh, the point here is the guy gets in grad school, right? And it's awesome, right? Because he just got there, he's going to all the frat mathematical parties and stuff like that, and everyone is there, turned down for math or something, you know? <laughs> and uh, and they're like, yeah, you want to look at this data set. This data set, he, he goes to a, like a private party. Yeah, look at this data set. You should totally use this data set. It's awesome. And then he's like, oh my God, this is a, are amazing results, right? I can predict my, my specificity and, and, uh, and sensitivity are amazing on this data set. I have totally created a killer algorithm. I have totally created something that's really, really valuable, right? And then the guys were like, oh, wow, that's cool. We should totally make a startup out of that, right? Why don't, we make, why don't we make some dough, bro? Let's do it, right? 
And then they start to apply this to real life data, right? And then you realize that it's not that easy, right? Maybe there are some limitations on the scope. Maybe there's, there's, there's a lot of things that you didn't understand, right? And the people really start to get desperate, right? And, and when I say math stop, it's, it's, it's both ways, right? The, the guy who is doing the research, he's like very flustered, right? He's very frustrated with not getting results. And the guys who are actually like the money part, they're like, okay, maybe we should stop with this math thing and try to do something more traditional, right? And we get to math is hard, let's go shopping. Right? And by shopping, I mean selling and being terribly, terribly successful. And that is all right, okay? When I say the has-beens here, right, I'm talking specifically about companies that they position their market presence around, I am doing this amazing cloud-based thing where I'm gathering data from all your your um, workstations or something, and I'll do some black box magical stuff here, and you'll know when you're breached. But actually, behind the scenes, they're just doing like indicator match matching. Okay, they have some good uh, uh, data sources there. They do their own research. They, they get data from other people. But at, at the end of the day, they're not doing any machine learning. They're not doing any analysis different than, can I compare these two strings of, uh, effectively in a, in, a, in a system, right? There's also the, the, the machine learning shrug, which are people who have absolutely nothing to do with machine learning. You cannot understand how it would apply to what they're doing, and they just add it as a feature to their, to their thing. But there are people who, f few and far between, that are trying to apply this to network security, to, to endpoint security, right, and trying to, do, uh, trying to do a relatively good job. Right, and uh, that's, these are the people who I really want to talk about in this talk, right? And try to give you guys an idea on what the challenges are on those specific, on those specific fields. So, I think we should start by anomaly detection, <laughs> and um, I think it's a good, it's a good thing to, it's a, it's a good place to start. And uh, what's interesting about anomaly detection is that, and I think it's very well, it's clear by the excuse me, it's clear by the wording, it's clear by what it should mean, right? It would work wonders if you actually know what normal is, right? So if you're trying to build a bunch of screws, right, and the screws have to be exactly this many millimeters, and you have this production line, and you can very specifically tell that if, it, if something is different from that, you're, you're doing a good job, that's, the, that, that's what it was built for. Right? You're trying to measure one objective, maybe two objective measures, right? And you are, you are getting, you know that a significant deviation from this norm, right? And it doesn't really matter how it's distributed, but you want to be that number. So it, you, can, you just model it as a, as, a, as, a normal, as a Gaussian distribution and you just go with it. I don't care. It, if it's significantly deviating, I don't, want, I don't want it to be on my production line. I want it to, to, to move forward, right? There is historical usage in anomaly detection in financial fraud prevention. I'm probably the least qualified person to be talking about that in this room. But uh, it, is, it is a good tool. It works, right? It works great for this kind of stuff as well, right? So I know I have a production environment in my, in my company, right? I know how much CPU usage, I know how much, uh, how much uh, memory usage my service should be having, right? Any significant deviation from that, which I have established to be my normal operating environment, it's something that should be alerted on, it's something that should be potentially investigated by a team, right? The problem is, uh, who says, right, that if there's a CPU spike, or there's a, a, a processing spike, or there's a network traffic spike, in a specific machine like this, that that's a security incident, right? And this is something that uh, I actually don't have in, in this slide. I'm gonna talk a little bit later, but it creates those, those fallacies that uh, you're actually trying to detect anomalies to try to figure out what is secure or not, right? So when I'm specifically talking about anomaly detection, I, I think there are two big groups of companies that, uh, in how they present themselves. You have the network slash NetFlow behavior analysis, right? And you have the new hotness is user behavior analysis, which to my understanding, it's just the network <laughs> behavior analysis, just a, a couple of, of, of uh, isolators up. You're pretty much modeling the same thing, but 
Anyway, I'll, 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 I'll go with it, right? So I'm talking about three, three specific challenges here, right? Which I'm gonna go into each one. And uh, I also suggest that as, as, a, as homework, right? You guys have a look at this paper from, uh, I forgot his first name, something summer. They're from Berkeley and Vern Paxson. Vern Paxson is actually the, the original researcher from the Bro IDS project, right? Which is, <laughs> it's funny because I found this paper maybe uh, uh, a month later then I, I, that I actually presented this talk for the first time. And it is almost blow by blow <laughs> what I'm telling you guys here, right? And he's, 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 he's uh, lining up the challenges that uh, new researchers find when they come into the information security and the network security world uh, and uh, explains pretty much what I'm, what I'm telling you. The, the biggest difference is that I'm conflating the, what he calls high cost of false positives and negatives and something that he very fancily calls a uh, semantic gap as something I'm gonna point out as Holland's razor, which is much funnier. You guys will enjoy the joke much more. So <laughs> anyway, what is this curse of dimensionality thing, right? And I think this is, the, this is probably the mathiest part of this, of this presentation, right? The problem is, if you're measuring, again, if you're measuring some, a deviation of something, you have to have a measure, right? You have to figure out what's the difference between a state A and state B. You have to figure out how are you, uh, how do you tell a difference of state between two different uh, positions in your environment, right? And traditionally, right, people will use something like Manhattan distance, which it is pretty much evocative of Manhattan, right? You are, if you're going from here to here, you're trying to do this distance, right? As if you were walking through city blocks. And of course, the Euclidean distance, you're just like at the hypotenuse there, right? The problem is, and I'll definitely not go into the math here, as you grow the amount of dimensions that you have in this measure, right? The actual distribution of distances, you're trying to measure the distance in this ridiculously high dimensional uh, uh, space, they all become the same. They all become very, very close to one. You can't really tell any differences apart because the space is so incredibly uh, uh, big that it, it starts becoming meaningless. So again, if you're trying to measure just one distance, if you're trying to, to measure the anomalies only on your CPU thing, you, you'll do a pretty good job on picking up those anomalies. But if you try to, okay, I'm actually gonna measure everything that this computer does, everything I can objectively measure from this computer and see if it's doing something anomalous, you're lost. Everything will look anomalous. Everything will, or not anomalous, really depends on where you're, you're, you're cutting your, your, your line there, right? So another way of understanding this is that if you try to put a sphere inside a cube, right? As you grow the number of dimensions, the size of that sphere becomes exponentially insignificant in relation to the size of the cube. So if you're trying to measure what is a one unit of distance around a sphere, a hypersphere or whatever, uh, everything is just too far away. You just can't really find anything there. The space is too humongous. And, it, and this is all very anti, this is not, unless you're used to working with this high dimensional data, I sure ain't. This is, this is very uh, uh, non-intuitive, right? But it becomes like very hopeless very fast. And uh, a practical example, right? Let's try to measure NetFlow data, right? Let, I have uh, uh, a thousand nodes, right? And you're just exponentiating stuff, the pairwise machines talking to each other, right? You have half a trillion possible dimensions if you're just measuring packet counts, right? And you have, if you have a thousand node uh, environment. So it really becomes very hard for you to do any sort of anomaly detection using network data or using um, NetFlow data, especially if you do not have a well-defined scope. And that's, that's the point that I, I want to get to, right? So there are a few ways to break the curse, right? And uh, most of the people who are, um, most of the serious people who are doing work around uh, anomaly detection, they will have an argument or two on why they are not successful to this, or why they are more likely to be successful in this space or not. So, so uh, there's actually one that I think is the most promising, which is, so actually their argument and why anomaly detection work is based on maybe 30 years of research 
of, uh, 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 I don't know how many post PhDs the guys has. So the, the guy's work has been trying to create sub-manifold spaces where this kind of data actually uh, works out. Is this the solution? Probably not. Or maybe it could, but it's like it's, this has been an open problem for forever. This is, this is an open problem, in, not in network security, not in anything, right? It is in, in this kind of structure, in this kind of, of, of work that we're doing, right? Again, there are a few results. Just make sure that whatever you're doing, you don't get fooled by this guy, right? The guy will say that he'll have a weird trick, right? And everything will just fit the model. You don't have to worry with the number of dimensions, right? And uh, it's just, you just need to, just need to make sure you do your due diligence, right? I would be cautious, right? Uh, and uh, uh, something that I usually tell people, it's like, if they had solved this for network security, they would probably be making a million times more, and I, I, I'm, I, I'm not increasing this number, by, I don't know, curing cancer, right? Or selling ads more effectively to us all. Right? There's not enough money to be made in network security to actually uh, tell that this is a development that will be made in network security. So there was actually so a quick anecdote from uh, from the time of what I was putting this together. It, I don't remember the name. Okay, yeah, Project Baseline. I, I love the name. It actually means that. Uh, it was one of this, this Google X initiatives where okay, now we're going to. We're going to try to uh, get as many DNA samples as we can from human beings to try to figure out if there is a baseline or any sort of anomaly detection we can work in order to predict distances. So Google, with all their power and all their money, are trying to do this, exactly this, for, for you know, curing diseases and stuff like that and making Larry Page immortal, which is, anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the plan as far as I, can, as far as I know. <laughs> anyway. This is one. So for two, and it's a much easier problem to, 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 to realize, is what I call the normality poisoning attacks, right? And, uh, and uh, if you do a little bit of work in machine learning, right, and, uh, and you've been exp exposed to it a little bit, the algorithms that you use are meaningless. They do not matter, right, at all, at all. You can just find and replace them there, okay, maybe there are some which are more tuned to numerical data, some that are more tuned to categorical data, but you can pretty much find, find, replace them. They don't matter. You get like very tiny variation. What you need to spend time on is what exactly are you trying to measure? What exactly are you trying to describe as a, as a, as a problem set for this algorithm? So it's what we call features, right? So if I, like I was describing on the NetFlow example, so maybe the feature in that thing would be how many packets were, trans was, were sent from machine A to machine B, or how much data was transferred between the machines. Those are all different measures which I can use to describe the problem or whatever that is. And uh, they, they would take the, 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 the place of the raw data that I'm, I'm feeding the algorithm. But even more important than that, Right, which pretty much grounds, and, and the ground truth is not, it, it, it's not a name that's used lightly. It's, okay, algorithm, I'm giving you all this data, right? I can already tell you, because I am an expert, or because I already did the legwork, that this is bad and this is good, right? And the, if you've done a great job with your algorithms, if you've done an amazing job with your features, right? You read all the documentation, you made all your uh, research around the, the, the data, exploratory data analysis, and all sorts of cool stuff that the kids do these days. If you label things wrong, it will mess up. If you're trying to answer the wrong question, it's what you, we usually say in this speak. If you haven't posed your question correctly, right, what am I trying to separate? So if I'm trying to tell one thing apart from another thing, can I really, do I really know what I'm trying to tell apart, A from B? Do I, can I really, effectively measure if I'm being successful in doing the separation, right? And the problem is, what is normal, right? When you're talking about anomaly detection, you're really trying to find some sort of outlier space there, or outlier, I have no idea how to say that word. Um, and uh, especially in information security, you get a huge asymmetry 
right? I mean, in a normal-ish network, you can hope that not every single machine is infected, or it's not 50-50, or something like that. So if you're trying to, to just have the machine pick it up, if you're just having the model pick it up, so it can figure out if there are two big groups as infected and non-infected machines, it's not gonna do it. There's, there's, there's probably not enough samples on the other side, right? And everything will be biased to the prevalent class. And then it doesn't get any results. People will tweak it and you get a bunch of false positives, which also bothers people very much. Um, and uh, I also like to talk about Waze in this. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Waze. It's, uh, it's a traffic app that was bought by Google maybe a year ago, right? And uh, it was very cool when it launched because uh, the, the, act, the, the users, they could warn each other, right? So, oh, uh, there was an accident here. I'm just beside the side of an accident. So I can mark on the tool, on the, on the application, that there was an accident here, right? And then the, the algorithms would adapt to that. And they would, okay, so it seems like there was an accident, uh, an accident here. I predict that that would be a next minute slowdown. So I, I probably should redirect the other users to a different path, right? So what would happen, and I have a, a, at least a few friends who told me that they did that. Uh, people would like, okay, it's 5 p.m., I need to leave work. I'm just gonna put a bunch of accidents around here so that traffic clears, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right? I mean, you, you, you have the control, right? You have control of the input. And, uh, and when I say poisoning, I really mean poisoning, right? I've had, I actually have a, a talk in my, in my, you know, the Instapaper kind of thing, you guys. Uh, stuff that you don't get to read because you're like fooling around on Twitter or something. And uh, it's, it's specifically about this. So the guy, I, I was, I was theori theorizing that and some people that I, I had more experience in red teaming, they already told, no, 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 we're very used to this sort of tool, and we know how exactly to control the volume of what we're doing so that we can pass this anomaly detection things. And there was actually a talk that happened on DerbyCon where the guy was explaining how he did that and how you can model that in order to get around. So if the data that you're using, right, if the data that the model is using is not on your control, Right? Or it's, it's absolutely in the control of the attacker, you're definitely gonna get problems. You're gonna get a bunch of things that you're gonna miss because, I mean, I think we already know that this is a kind of an arms race. And once these, these things start getting good, more and more techniques about how to evade this are gonna be more prevalent. Finally, I wanna talk about Hanlon's razor, which is pretty much my favorite, and was the single reason why everything that I tried to deploy on Provencia failed. So, Yay, you found an anomaly, very good. Okay, who tells, who, why is that an attack? Why is an anomaly an attack, right? And more often than not, it wouldn't be. It, w it would be maybe a legitimate incident or an accident, right? But then you would totally oversubscribe the security team, which thought that they were actually implementing a security tool in their environment. Right? And they would just get burned out, and on the second day they would just turn off the, the, the alerting on the tool, because they obviously could not, could not uh, handle with that. And the ops team was like, okay, no, you, you're always bothering me security. I have actual work to do here, or something, because they, they, didn't, they didn't respect that this, actually these suggestions were coming from the security team. So usually it, it would work better if it was the other way around. You actually had, uh, an, a kind of anomaly detection is to, tool, which is tied to maybe single metrics and things like that, that would be reporting to, uh, to the ops team. And that's the whole concept of uh, continuous monitoring for, for DevOps, right, and continuing, continuous integration. And then if it's something that absolutely no one else can, can explain, okay, okay, maybe now we need to, to, act, to call secu the security team in, because we've now did this, this this triage here, right, and, 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 and getting with it. And uh, this, this is the semantic gap, right? Why is this really a security? Uh, why is the anomaly, why does the anomaly mean security uh, issue, right? And there's the, the high cost, right? And that's the problem with, uh, with, uh, with security. There's a very high cost associated with uh, getting a false positive or a false negative because the security uh, team resources are very scarce. Right? So anyway, next time you get to face an anomaly detection tool and you get to face a, an anomaly uh, created incident, ask yourself 
who done it, right? Was it the evil hacker or was the, the hipster developer you just hired that is learning how to do Node.js and MongoDB, right? And just push some code to the production to get closer to the metal. And yeah, we just, just bought your website down. But anyway, <clears throat> what about user behavior, right? And I'm a little bit more positive about user behavior than uh, the network because as a supervised uh, tool, right, and if you are using it not as a catch-all thing, but oh, I'm actually modeling user behavior of my product. I'm actually modeling uh, under the constraints of what my product can do, right, be it a web application or be it a system that you control, right, and it, so you can objectively measure different things there and you can uh, objectively control the scope of what's going on, right? You, you, you have a well-defined label of stuff that people can and cannot do. You can do some interesting stuff, right? So there are some examples. I, I, can, I, I, I need to provide uh, some links on this presentation, but I, ha I had a paper that I had, which was a companion to this, which had those links. But if you search for Airbnb uh, machine learning for fraud prevention or something, you'll get to there thing, there, there's a similar query for, for Square. When they say fraud prevention there, they're not saying fraud in the, in the way that we used to in, as, as far as, as financial fraud, but in a way to trying to subvert the way that the system works. It's more like product security in most cases. Square is half and half, I'd say. But, um, but it bothers me when companies come forward and they, they claim to have a general solution to this, right? So, I mean, I, I, you, you will find a bunch of companies now which are anti-NSA or something, right? Oh, no, 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 sorry, not anti-NSA, the opposite. They are anti-Snowden. And uh, they will, oh, you'll never have another uh, file exfiltrated here. And uh, it's very easy. You just plug in this magic machine learning box here. You create all the roles for all your users. Right? And then you do the information classification for every single piece of data that you have. Bro, why do I need the machine learning? <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, and it's not, it's not uh, uncommon, right, that the people who actually come forward with the solutions, they actually come from a long history of serving in the armed forces. Because all these things are a given, right? And that's great. They have to. And of course, you can. You can argument. You can always argument a system that already works, right? You you get a percentage of, of improvement there, right? Maybe there's a quantum of improvement, but it comes from that assumption, right? And that's just not the case in commercial uh, environments, right? Maybe very few of them. So that's probably not the answer we're looking for, right? I mean, it bothers me that the guys who say that they are building the anti-exfiltration, they're usually ex NSA. I don't know if it bothers anyone else. I don't think they would be the best, but anyway, I, I have no stake in this game, so I, I don't really care. So, uh, but the thing that, that, that uh, also gets me is if you're doing some sort of general solution to this, are you maybe modeling each one of the internal applications you have separately? Are you like averaging them out? So yeah, the user, they just came back from Siricon, right? And they put on a bunch of expense requests there. So that's anomalous behavior for his expense uh, application. So now he cannot get into his email because he's probably bad to something bad. How, do you, I mean, is there a normal distribution of user behavior? It, it, it doesn't add up. I mean, it, it, it's, it's weird, right? It's weird. And, and uh, I will say that I do not have enough information about how these, these companies claim to do work, right? I assume that it, it will be along those lines of trying to model some sort of thing around the applications and trying to do some objective measurements and anomaly detection on this. It's just that it's complicated. It's much more complicated than, than, than it would seem at, at first. And I know that we want to believe that these things would work, right? Anyway. So let's talk to something, something, something better now. <clears throat> I want to talk about classification. So Jay knows that I'm very negative about unsupervised machine learning. He almost apologized for me when he said he was doing some uh, unsupervised machine learning. I love unsupervised. I just don't love it on my production model. It's, it's, it's different. And um, so I want to talk about classification because I think cl uh, you actually being able to describe something and tell something against the other is, is it, we have a better chance, right, of getting something done. So this example, 
And this is actually a, a slide that I usually repeat through all my presentations because I could not find a better way to explain classification than this slide. Uh, I'm, I'm totally accepting suggestions. But so let's say I want to tell apart dogs and cats, right? And uh, that's what I got, right? I got a picture to go, to go by, right? And I'm, I'm going to try to model. I mean, maybe no, no, fur size, right? How big is how big the fur? What the color is, right? How happy they are, maybe it's it's a feature, right? Are they majestic or you know, and thoughtful? I don't know. So I'm gonna try to throw a bunch of these features, right? And uh, as, as you guys can can probably tell, I'll have there's two different problems I can come up with here. First of all, for, the first one of them is to be able to is to choose the wrong features, right? So. Maybe color is not a great feature because we know from experience that this model doesn't know it's it's a dumb model that there's there's a whole range of different colors you shouldn't just have like uh, golden and majestic and 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 uh, white and brown right uh, there's an even bigger problem here with the bias in our data set because we only have grumpy cats and we only have doges right so we'll have a hard time okay click click we have a hard time classifying this guy. Right? I mean, there's no such thing as happy cats, surely, right? That's what the model's telling us. At the same time, you'd have a very hard time classifying this guy. This is not, this is not a majestic dog by any chance. But I really love classification, right? And I think that it is a good, it is a good, it's a good way to go forward if you can actually get the data and you can actually try to model. Again, it's all about the question and what you're modeling as far as the, uh, the question is concerned. So um, it has become very popular to try to uh, classify malware activity as well, right? And uh, again, it's, it's, um, it, it ties a little bit to the place, to the, to the situation of, oh, what's the behavior of this, of this malware? But don't be fooled by it. You actually can, you can objectively measure. You're not trying to find the normal. You can objectively get a bunch of malware samples and see what it does and get a bunch of normal uh, programs and see what they does, right? And uh, in my perspective, right, people people have been doing. There's a lot of, of papers on this, and uh, I think there's much more success I have found in actually after you know something is is a malware, you try to figure out where it came from in the sense of what's the code lineage on this, right? There's a, there's a bunch of very cool research which I think has been very successful in. This is a bunch of malware uh, different samples, right? It, are they more likely this family or that family? Do they share code with these things? And this is, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do automating this. But uh, the point about malware activity that gets me is that there's a little known fact in the, in the I don't know, machine learning security community that's, con that's like five people. Uh, <laughs> that uh, who actually has the state of the art on this and has been doing this work of clustering malware, classifying malware, and trying to figure out if you can find the patterns and tell them apart and tell what malware is or isn't, are AV companies, which we constantly bash all the time, that are not doing a good work. They've had the largest amounts of samples forever. I mean, they are, some of them are like maybe 20 years old, right? And they have been, I mean, it, 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 I was surprised when I, when I was talking to, to, to antivirus companies. Yeah, we've had a Hadoop cluster ever since Hadoop was here. And we've been putting all the data there, and we've been running MapReduce on it to try to figure out the features. So, the, so what bothers me, right? Can we really get better than AV and heuristics, right? AV heuristics suck. I never turn it on. It always gets like a bunch of stuff that used to be bad, it, it, it are actually good, right? So. I mean, I'm not claiming that there isn't uh, uh, a solution here in this space. I just don't think that at this moment in time we have done better than this, right? Granted, some of the companies uh, I've talked to, they are, oh, we actually were a part of this team on AV, and uh, they didn't want to fund this properly, or they, they didn't want to run all the crazy experiments that we wanted to run, so we just spun off and did something. So yeah, maybe we are onto something here, right? But again, we just have to be cautious about what's the quality of the, of, of the research that's being done and what's being uh, brought up this, because some of these guys, they will do their machine learning model and they will select their, their samples to do the training. It's evil malware against calculator.xe, right? I think it's, it's going to be a very good model, right? So 
the joke that I tell is that, is there something that we could potentially train those things against that was able to, I don't know, download code from the internet, right? Execute arbitrary code that they download, right? Have access to uh, many resources on the machine and file systems and all those things. I mean, have you ever heard of any, any uh, uh, program that we have that is able to do such thing, right? And uh, it becomes very hard because it, it, the way that the things that our, the, the systems that we have in our computer can do, in many measures, right, they are, they approximate what an evil, evil malware would do, spe specifically browser. I, I, I have a more technical joke here where I kid that maybe the solution is look for sandboxes. So if it has a sandbox, right, it's a browser. So if it doesn't have a sandbox, it's a malware. But then Firefox came and come on Firefox, get your act together. We need a, we need a, we need a sandbox here. Anyway, this is tough, but I want to believe, right? I don't think that, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that any of this work is, is specifically um, a waste of time, right? The opposite, I have tried to, maybe only for cognitive, maybe for cognitive dissonance, I don't think this work is a waste of time because that's what I've been doing for the past few years. But, uh, uh, the, there is a lot of interesting things. You just have to be, make sure that whomever you're working with or talking to has tried to do their homework and has, I mean, and seems to know what they're talking about, right? And this is why I propose this kind of security machine learning buyer's guide in a way, right? Which is to try to, to figure out I think things that I believe are important, right? To try to tell people that, to ask uh, the companies if they are trying, they're actually trying to do some work that will be, uh, uh, can have some chance of, of, of bringing results, or it's just like for, for show or something like that. So, and uh, it's a little bit biased for not accepting anomaly detections for reasons that I've, I've talked a lot about on this, but anyway, your, your mileage may vary. So I guess the first thing is what, why are you adding machine learning, right? Because I mean, some things are obviously done better with, uh, uh, with signatures. Some things are actually, I mean, machine learning is, oh yeah, I can approximate this. No, 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 you can actually do a much better job with this much simpler thing, right, that has been known for X amount of years, right? So there should be a legitimate answer and what is the process or what is the actual thing that you're trying to, to improve here, right? And on the same level, right, what is, in the sense of what's the question that you're trying to answer, which is what you're trying to achieve, right? Is what are the sources of ground truth, right? If you're objectively trying to tell something apart from another, how do you understand what are the sources that you're trying to consume to make sure that uh, you're training your model, your models correctly? So similarly, can you protect this data that you are gathering from adversaries, right? I mean, you probably cannot do that uh, for a bunch, for a lot, some of the things that you're collecting, right? But uh, if you are, if you take the time to, okay, let's try to look for things that maybe are outside the control of those adversaries, I can get some more, uh, less variability in my model if I'm actually being targeted by someone. And finally, which I think that for so many people talking about machine learning, there's so little people talking about how do you work around false positives, right? Because it doesn't matter what technique you're using, right? If you, if you create a model and you're getting 100%, I can assure you the model is wrong. That's not the way these things work, right? So, and specifically because of the high cost of the false positives and the false negatives, right? Is, the way, is, is there another way that the, the solution that you're providing compensates for this, right? Or, I mean, it's just, up to the user or it's up to your team? And I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you face this problem, right? What, how are you trying to handle this? If anyone tells you, oh, but we do not have false positives, just run as fast as you can to the door. I mean, that's the, that's the, the best advice that I can give you. So anyway, just make sure that if someone gives you an answer that you don't like, you hashtag them, and, and they tell them, no, 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 my algorithm is different. They're not uh, up to any of this. I'm not, I'm not like all the other ones. Just hashtag them, not all algorithms. It's, I think, it's, I think that's, that's, the way to, that's the way to shame them. <laughs> anyway, uh, I just want to wrap up 
and talk a little bit about my work, right? And it's, this has been a long talk about all the stuff that I think that doesn't work. And I just want to talk a little bit about the stuff that I think that work, right? And it's been like the, the, the things that I've been trying to build for this time. So MLSEC project is actually a research slash open source branch of a company called Nido, as in Nido in the haystack, haha, <laughs> very funny. And uh, we are, uh, it's really about trying to find the solutions, right? And try to apply, find ways that machine learning can be applied effectively uh, to, to information security, right? And being very forthcoming about what these techniques are and what we're, how we're trying to build them. And why should they, why should it care? Why should you care about them, right? And, uh, you know, we're looking for beta tests. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're building at least, and this is like, this is not even a product yet. This is something that we're, we're having a technology beta and we're on track to launch next year or something. So just in an overview, right? And you'll notice that I'm trying to follow a structure that I presented before, right? So what I'm trying to build, right, is something that can be very much grounded in information that's available in ground truth, which is about threat intelligence. So I'm not sure how much of you are familiar with the way that with the confusion around threat intelligence, what it is and what it isn't, right? But uh, there's a bunch of these uh, if information feeds and block lists and things like that, that uh, some companies acquire the raw data, and some companies acquire raw data and a bunch of different stuff to, to try to do some internal research uh, to, to see, okay, I've known that these specific actors, be they IP addresses or domain names or maybe malware samples, they are associated with this group or that group and, and how you can. And then now that you know that these IP addresses are bad or something, then you can you potentially take some action on this. So most people, they'll just buy this and use them as block lists of some sort, right? And uh, on the, but, or they will have an enormous team that will actually do research and try to learn the patterns and try to understand uh, if there's something that's going on here that looks similar to what these things look like, maybe it's something I should act upon, right? So what we're trying to do is really to, to take the human being out of that equation because that work, this, this, this actually uh, pattern matching stuff, it's something that uh, uh, machine learning uh, is, is very good at, right? So if you can figure out the different ways that these uh, data analysts, they do their, their analysis and the pivots and everything, and you can extract features out of that, right? And you use the, the same threat intelligence, the same raw data that these guys would use, right? You can emulate what a, a, a tier one analyst would do pretty, pretty well as far as prioritizing things that should be investigated further, right? And uh, again, it's not gonna, t the, the joke that I tell you is that it's not gonna tell you like it was Colonel Mustard in the library with the, with the chandelier, but it's gonna tell, man, uh, you know, you should check out that library, that, that library because it's, something's gonna happen over there, right? And we're really trying to make it simple. We don't want people, although, although we, we, we're trying to work as a threat intelligence uh, company, it's not about sending you the data, it's about consuming your information, your network data, and telling you, okay, these are the things that you should investigate further, right? You can also do it yourself. You can, we have tools that we released uh, earlier this year on how you can download threat intelligence feeds yourself and run some simple statistical tests on them to see if they're really good, right? If they're really up to snuff, right? And uh, you can find out things like this, right? How much do the feeds actually create new new information on them or how much they actually are taking out day by day, right? You don't want a feed that never takes out IP addresses because otherwise you get, you give them enough time, they're, they're, you're block listing the whole internet, right? Or you can find out stuff like this, right? When you get some different feeds, and these are all open source feeds, right? I'm not shaming anyone. Okay, I'm shaming a few guys here. But uh, it's about how much overlap are between them, right? So you, you're spending money on these guys and actually you're getting a third of your money's worth because two thirds of them are actually shared between each other. And I used, to, I used to tell people that you just, right now these days you just set up a honeypot and you're threat intelligence all the way to the bank. It's like, it's amazing. Just, just set up honeypots guys, it's, it's awesome. So anyway, just, just wrapping up. The ground truths are of course the, the, the feeds themselves, right? And uh, there's a lot, 
the most simply, the most challenging thing usually on these thing, on these models are what are known malicious, right? And this is something that a few companies have tried to, to collaborate with information in the past, but you really need to get creative on trying to expand your knowledge on what is potentially good or not. So you can try to seed the model and try to create a balanced model that you can use to, 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 to predict, right, if something's gonna be bad or not. A lot of the, the filling the blanks there is done by features that are, are generated by the customer data itself. And, uh, but then when you talk about the data tampering problem, a lot of the features are coming from external sources. So we're talking about GOIP, ASN information. These are all things that, which is the IP address the, the attacker is potentially coming from? Which is the domain the attacker is coming from? Which are things that, it's not like it's impossible for an attacker to change, but they actually have a cost associated with them. So it's something that it, their, their ability to control is hindered by their, 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 the, their willingness to target you and their resources. So it, it becomes an interesting thing for you to pivot on uh, while you are trying to do these investigations, right? And uh, finally, false positives are a part of everything, right? And we're striving to make sure that whatever gets to the front of a tier two or three analyst, it's not stupid. So we, we constantly get, I mean, I don't know if that's, an, it's, if that's, uh, if that's uh, a compliment or not, but yeah, this is very good. I might, our analysts would have been fooled by that as well, right? And we're constantly working with the companies to, with their feedback. And this is something that the, as we get feedback on these sorts of things, the model is, is, gets pretty smart on, on getting stuff that are specifically for, for a customer. Anyway, that's it. Just wanted to, to put it out there. Thank you very much. Great questions, Ari. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, I realize that most of your work has been on network traffic and network logs, but I'm curious about uh, spam traffic and uh, machine learning for spam detection. Is it possible that a huge portion of spam traffic is actually there to train the filters so that they block what they want to be blocked and let through what they want to let through? And with the scale of botnets and spam traffic, isn't such an offensive strategy eminently feasible? Have you read this somewhere, or this is just your, your own personal, your own personal? In my uh, private moments, this thought came <laughs> to me. <laughs> your own personal, uh, what's a conspiracy theory? That's actually a pretty, pretty good question. And uh, I think it's plausible. It is it's completely plausible. The thing is, it doesn't really, I don't think it matters that much because uh, when someone, again, and this is, has absolutely nothing to do with machine learning, but in network, secu network security in general, uh, when someone is really out to get you, right, they really try to craft an email that are specifically for you. So, uh, and this is why any spam filter is, is mostly useless against a targeted phishing attack, because it's not spam, right? It's very specific, right? But yeah, okay, this is gonna be fun. Yes. So I was specifically referring to cases that's not uh, phishing, so it's not targeted to a single one. Mm -hmm. But if I'm a spammer and I'm promoting, let's just say, pharmacies or something else, mm -hmm. and I know that 99.9% .9 of traffic will be blocked, couldn't I generate traffic that fits that pattern and trains the spam filters to block certain things and essentially uh, let through the, the, the variety that I want to let through that is the real aim of my campaign? Theoret I think theoretically, yes, but uh, the level of coordination necessary between different actors, because it's not like there's one single spammer that will do this. So it, you probably would be overshadowed by other competing spammer groups, right? But as a, as a principle, if they all got together in a room and, and created some cunning plan, I think that, I think that yes. I, actually, there's a paper that I didn't read as well that was very forthcoming about describing what was the state of the art on anti-spam uh, machine learning training right now. And uh, I'm not sure if they would compensate for something like that. 
I mean, I have no idea what's the percentage of the overall spam traffic would be necessary to create a false flag like that. That is a very good question. Okay. We're going to do one more question, and then um, I hate to do this to you because I know a lot of people want to ask you questions, but we're running into a bit of a crunch. So one more question, and then we're going to take a five-minute break and get ready for the next presentation. Yeah, I was happy with review yesterday. Now I'm not so happy. <laughs> uh, we may need to take this offline, but... Um, I've, I've read a fair bit of research in machine learning. I don't really have all the advanced math skills, but I think I know a couple things. So there's a concept called a base rate or population prevalence. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me as uh, if with a really low population prevalence, uh, you tend to have a lot of false positives and a very low positive predictive value. As your population prevalence goes up, um, your false positives decrease. So the machine language learn papers that I've read, at least in the area of malware, seem to construct training sets that are almost guaranteed to succeed. Yes. And it seems to me that that's one way that maybe these guys game their accuracy is if you've got a, if you've got 70 percent known samples in your training set, I mean, you could just flip a coin and still get it right at least half the time. So I just want, you're nodding, so I think you're yeah, agreeing I agree, 100%. with me. I just want to see if you have yeah. any further comments. Um, let me see if I have any further, if there's anything that I can add to that. Because th this is exactly the kind of thing that happens, right? And in a way, you have to try, if you're training a model, um, you have to somehow try to, the problem is there's two different problems there, right? And uh, when the base rate is, is, is not the same on your training set and as it is in the real data that you want to test the, the, the thing on, there are some things that you can try to do, some cautions that you, 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 you try to use to prevent this, this model that you constructed, this training model that you constructed. Uh, does not, and the, the language is overfit, right? It doesn't start to think that that's the actual prevalent b base rate, right? And it, try, it tries to, and you, you pretty much like, you, you error a bunch of things out. You, you confuse the model on purpose to make it more robust on these kind of things. But uh, the actual, I haven't seen, uh, so the point that I want to get to is that I have not seen many papers that, that uh, talk about these kinds of techniques as an important part in doing this sort of training so that a model will have uh, 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 sensitivity and specificity rate that is similar to the training set. So what you described is a problem and I have all also seen what you have, what you have uh, said. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is sometimes you have to train it like that, right? Because uh, with this 50-50 or something like that because you need to in a way, you need to teach the model uh, in a balanced way, right? Because otherwise, it's 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 hard for it to pick up the. It will think that the the actual. So, okay, here's the here's the the kicker, right? So let's say I try to to I try to respect the rate of uh, of uh, actual malware in 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 the wild, right? Maybe oh, I don't know, 0.01 percent, right? I, you know, let's guess a number, right? I don't think that the number of malware uh, samples is so much more. It, it, it's it's going to be a percentage of the actual good or, or benign software, right? If you would train a model like that, it will just return non-malicious because if it returns non-malicious, its error rate would be just the number of malware samples there. So it is and it isn't a problem. It's a challenge of the training. Right, but if you don't, if you do this 50-50 and you don't take the, the proper experimental precautions and the model building uh, precautions, there uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, it, what's gonna happen is what I was describing for the KDD in the sense that you'll get an awesome result here, and then when you go to the real life, you're not catching anything or you're getting a bunch of false positives. That's helpful. Thank you. No, th <laughs> thank you for the question. I just flailed about to try to answer it. I just I had to answer it three times. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Alex Pinto. Big hand again for Alex Pinto. Thanks, guys.